Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to actually sort of start by saying the presentation I've given going to give is uh, on Juniper Notes, which is the last link um, in the book. And I've prepared like little fiddles, uh, DB fiddles of the examples. So if you want to go ahead and play with those on your own, you're not going to interrupt anyone else um, on the, the moment. So hopefully that'll give you some time to actually uh, create some really insightful questions uh, as I go along. Uh, so what I, why I'm giving this t uh, a talk today is I've seen people use SQL but sort of aren't actually aware of some of the, the later features in um, MariaDB uh, that can actually help with queries. Now the first uh, is um, going to talk about is common table expressions which came along in MariaDB 10.2 um, and what they do if we uh, look at example we just got a temp sample table We've got this structure here uh, in the middle of a CTE. So we've got the form of width, then we've got a the name of the common table expression, and then we'll bracket that in a little bit of SQL to uh, what it is. And so what this does, it actually behaves like a view for the purpose of a transaction. Now, for something as simple as this, you know, it's fairly basic. We're, we're from a set of uh, student tests. We've filtered it down to just the SQL test. Now, on this own, that, that's probably not very useful. But if in our next example, what we've done is we've created a common table expression, the same one. And then we've actually select uh, to get all the students that actually have the same score. So, T1 equals T2, the same name um, on those. And because we actually constructed our uh, common table expression as SQL, we don't need to pin both tables uh, to that name. Where common table expressions really come to uh, a powerful play is with recursive um, common table expressions. So here we've created a table of bus routes. Um, I've set max recursive uh, iterations to 20 because it's quite easy, uh, I guess, with recursion to uh, put the wrong criteria and you end up um, uh, going for a, a very large time. Now, the form of a common table expression is uh, or a recursive one. You start with, with recursive. You've got your CTE name. And that's like before is what we use in the results. The first bit of the commentation, uh, the CTE is the anchor data. So this is a select table type statement that provides the initial data in the table. And I'll get to what that means shortly. This uh, statement determines how many uh, columns the CTE will have and it will also determine their type um, and, and the names because if you do select Bob as um, name then name becomes the column name. Next part of the CTE is a union. Um, it, there can be more than one union um, in a row and what we have is a recursive part of the select. Now the recursive part of a select is normally a join against the uh, initial table name CTE. And what the recursive part of the select is, it says from your initial data, we're going to select more data, hence the join aspect, and, and add to the CTE. So what the SQL engine underneath does is it keeps on doing that until it finds no uh, more results, and then you've got a data set. Once you have a data set, uh, like the non-recursive CTEs, you can do a select from CTE uh, and do um, get the data that way. So in this example, we're going to say, how do I get, uh, where can I go from New York 
um, given our, our data above. So the, the first bit of the select, as I said before, is the anchor. And this says select from the bus routes where the origin is New York. Um, and if we look at our bus routes before, um, yep, yeah, there we go. We can see, we can go for a number of places from New York. So what the recursive part of the CTE says, well, okay, we've got bus destination was the, um, the CTE name. So where a uh, bus destination um, can match the uh, bus routes of the origin, um, that's where we can go. And we add that to the results. So with that, we get all these bus routes, um, including Sydney. Yes, buses can go to Sydney from New York. They just get wet. With CTEs, especially recursive CTEs, you need to watch about the casting. If we've got an anchor statement that sort of says select null um, as the anchor point, and this is uh, some point where you might want to start on a tree uh, to go out that way. Remember I said the data type is actually derived from the anchor. And so what this will mean is that there's a varchar zero or, or similar zero length structure. And when you join it against another query, uh, you'll get this never shows up, cast down to a, a varchar zero, uh, which doesn't display really well. So with recursive CTEs, you'll need a cast statement. Um, if you know your data is uh, going to exceed what is the default uh, type. Um, for the anchor. In MariaDB 10.5, what was added was a cycle restrict. So if we create our table here, we've just got a from and to, we've got a bunch of values, um, and there they are. Uh, we've got a recursive CDE here, and I'll go through it a bit. We've done something different. We've put the field names at the top, um, and that's instead of putting the field names in here. Uh, it's just an alternate form, it means the same thing. So here we're starting with zero as the depth, that's the beginning, uh, zero is the distance, one is the from, one is the two, and that's the beginning of the data. We union that with depth path one, so uh, every time we do a recursive iteration through, we're going to get a higher value of depth. Uh, we're getting a distance for arbitrary reasons. We're adding the absolute distance between the numbers and the from and to, and we're selecting this from our T1 table. We're joining it to our CTE, where the from number is in the CTE2 number. So whatever's connected to one on the first iteration will become into the CTE, and then again, and again, and again. And what this gets is a fairly large table, and this is only uh, restricted because I did a max recursive levels equals 20, which is why there's 20 down the bottom. Uh, it's quite easy to get carried away with the CTEs, and, and so what, we've done in MariaDB 10.5 is we've added a keyword cycle restrict. Now cycle restrict includes a list of field names and that will determine uh, what will stop the CTE from recursing is when those pair of values are the same as what occurred before. So on our running list CTE we get 1, 1, 2, 1, and, and all the way down, and after forward one, we, we're repeating what's here, but if we look at here, the fifth row here is two one, sorry, one two, I do have dyslexia. So that's the same as this one. So it goes, aha, we're in a cycle, we break out of our CTE. And this way you can do things like, I, I want to find all the ways to this destination, 
But once you've found that destination, there's no point doing an exhaustive search uh, to come up with the same answer. Now, insert returning is also a new feature in UB 10.5. And what this is an extension on is in ReDB uh, 10.3, there was a delete returning if you wanted to delete the data but have a copy of it. Um, and also in ReDB 10.5, we added a replace returning, which follows the same syntax as here. And the obvious question to ask here is, why would you want to return data that you've just inserted? And, and the trick is, um, what you're inserting into the rows isn't always um, every element that you have, i.e. there's uh, columns like auto increment uh, that have values. You can have a, a column that has a UUID generated. And what's useful to do in those cases, if you insert a bunch of names, is to have the that, that return to you. And that's what I've done with this statement. We've inserted Bob, Jane, Fred, and Harry into the table. And what we've got back is their um, auto increment values. Now this, uh, in whatever language you're using, you'd actually treat the insert statement as if it was a select. So you'd have a cursor on it, you'd uh, fetch the results back, and, and you'd get those values. But what if we've got something different? We've got um, a unique uh, key on, on the table. Now what we happens if we do the insert is we get a duplicate key because Bob's already on the table. Now something we might want to do with um, a statement is we go, well, okay, let's just do that and um, ignore any duplicate things and see what we get. and what we get back is we get a bunch of IDs and with IDs on their own it wouldn't be obvious as to which one got eliminated so we include the name and here we get back the set of data actually got inserted into the database and so there's a number of uh, applications for this kind of uh, consistency to eliminate make you able to do one query rather than multiple if you didn't have this what you'd be doing is you'd be inserting um, one row at a time and looking at the, the last ID value or probing backs. So we've made this a, a lot easier for the programmers here. Another feature that's been around for a while is system version tables uh, in MariaDB 10.3. Uh, there is a SQL standard form uh, that looks like this where we add a a start and a stop timestamp. Uh, we define a period and we call it with system versioning. MariaDB decided to put a simpler form um, since a lot of those fields were just very verbose. And what we also wanted to do was to hide the, ties to, to hide the timestamps um, such that um, it doesn't appear in select star. So with the, the second form here, we insert a bunch of data, we select from it, we only see the X column uh, in the tables. Now that doesn't mean the row start and row end aren't there, they are just hidden. If you actually explicitly select from them, you'll get the timestamps of when the data was inserted and when the data got deleted. And by default, that's the, the maximum value of um, time. So what this is useful for is if you want to maintain the full history of a table, but um, most of the time you're just wanting to look at the current values and you don't want to do a lot of coding around, okay, if I delete something, I've got to move it to a different table. This way, the deleted starter can still be in the same table. And if we do a delete, um, all for x equals five, we insert a couple of values. We do a select, and as we see, the default select um, doesn't show x equals 5 because we deleted it, strangely enough. However, there's an extended syntax 
that says select for all time every element of this table. So what we see here is that the x equals five uh, row um, appears and we can see when it was added and when it was deleted. Now a number of different variants uh, of that can apply. For instance, if we look at one of the timestamps in there, we can say, what did this table look like as of a particular timestamp? And we get those list of values. And there's a syntax below which is um, show it for a, a range of times. So all values that exist at the table between a certain set of times. And we can, you know, drop and, and recreate a versioning on a table. So we drop the versioning, the syntax no longer supported, then we can add it back. And this time we use the, the more explicit version of it there. The other version, uh, rather than just timestamps, is what we've done is to be able to include InnoDB transaction IDs um, in the table. And for some situations, this makes more sense um, than timestamps on that because you can compare it to uh, other, other things, including logs and, and other audible records. Uh, the InnoDB transaction timestamps are global throughout the InnoDB engine. So if there's other uh, tables with also system versioning, you'll be able to see which ones um, occurred on, on the exact transaction rather than trying to work out whether a, a microsecond difference is actually applicable. As we see, we can insert a bunch of values and if they're in the same transaction, they'll get the same transaction start ID. And for the rest of the point, the uh, syntax is, is fairly similar. We can select what a table looks like as of a particular transaction ID. Uh, we can make these transaction IDs invisible um, by including that in invisible columns directive at the, when we're creating the table. And here, when we do a select star, we won't actually have the InnoDB transaction IDs. However, like before, um, they do exist. A common case for what you'd want to do when actually having a history is to actually partition it off. So you've got a separate uh, historical partition and a record of the current one. And this means if you're doing a lot of current queries, you're not actually trawling through historical records in the background, um, which uh, makes it a little bit uh, slower to retrieve the current records. So partition off gives that separation. It also enables you to delete the history. And obviously there must be one current partition. If we've got a number of history partitions, we can impose a limit on them. So here at your history will fill up partition zero, and then it'll fill up partition one. Um, it's quite silly just to stop it there when partition one gets full. So that'll start to issue a warning um, when partition one is actually full. Another way to partition data is to Partition it by the time on an interval of months and say 12 partitions. And there's more details on, on the knowledge base on this. And this is the kind of you'd use for rolling over data. MariaDB uh, in 10.5 actually added the INET D data type, INET 6, and it obviously can store INET 4 as well. I probably should have included more examples of this. But you just treat that as a normal type. You insert normal strings into it. And what you'll get is an optimized storage of um, IP6 data. There's some constraints around it. You can't just cast it to a decimal type. It won't work. However, it's got full equivalence to something like var binary 16, 
which you might have been using already for IPv6 types. So you can select in uh, to T2, the same that it was T1. Uh, we look at it and it's the same uh, representation of IPv6 addresses. We can do a join on it and it will treat the VAR binary and the in INET6 data type as the same. If we do here, we um, looking at what it does with values. Um, here we do collace. If, if A is null, um, A will actually define the data type, which is INET6, uh, but otherwise it will return B. So what it does here is it returns the uh, uh, the IP address because this the first entry clearly uh, translates, but the second one isn't actually an invalid IP address, so it throws an error and shows up in the warnings. So what we another feature that was added in MariaDB 10.4 was application time periods. Uh, so we've got a bunch of data here. It's got from and two times. Um, the period on itself becomes useful when we say we want to delete a portion of uh, a data. And what that does is it um, clearly, uh, cuts and slices the data of, of those rows. So row A wasn't actually within the time period. Uh, so it's entirely unchanged. Uh, row B had a bunch of data above um, 2001. And so what it does is it's truncated the top end and it's also put a bottom end, uh, a new row in for what was actually after 2008. Uh, table C had a bunch of data up until 2017, so it was truncated uh, down to its 2001 time. And yeah, table D had a start period in 2001 and therefore it cut off as well. So yeah, there's a number of ways you can actually use that. And you can also, I guess, not only delete, you can um, do an update, and that does a similar sort of thing. It replaces um, the data was originally with a new entry. A most useful thing if you're ever doing uh, bookings in uh, a hotel or reservations or anything is with your time periods. Uh, by default, if you do this in statement um, as it is, uh, there's no checks for overlaps. So here we see that uh, the, the last visitor actually overlaps with the second visitor when, when they um, did the bookings. So here we add a unique constraint, if I get it right, of the room number and the period without overlaps. So what happens here if we try to actually insert a duplicate Overlapped, it will actually give us a duplicate key error. And this saves just doing a, a lot of application code to do the, the same thing. So that's all the questions I actually uh, wanted to, or syntaxes I wanted to present today. Uh, there's probably a very little amount of time for um, questions, but you're welcome to ask them. Hi, Mr. Daniel. Thank you so much for a uh, speech just now. Um, we are a bit short on time. We have one minute left for Q&A. Does anyone want to quickly voice out their questions or quickly type them out in the public chat? Yep. Um, well, I'll, I'll be on a short time afterwards for the discuss, um, but uh, otherwise, uh, please welcome Vicente on, on his next talk and thank you for hosting me here.